humans rely on visualization to make sense of the world, to learn, and to also communicate knowledge about objects that are so small, objects that are massive, processes that are too slow or processes that are too fast. My colleagues and I have a passion to explore how visualization impacts learning and how visualization impacts the way that we construct knowledge. And tonight I want to tell you about the idea of exploration, a situation where we combine visualization as an exploratory tool and visualization as an explanation tool. And how this combination can tell us a lot about the power of visualization for learning and for communication into the future. This is a visualization that is very relevant to you. It's a visualization that you've actually been interpreting for two years. You've been interpreting a structure that you cannot actually see, that is beyond our immediate sensory exposure through vision. So we rely on symbols and a visual language to give meaning to something that we cannot see. You need to process this visual language in order to construct the idea of the coronavirus molecule. We can take the same idea and we can change the language slightly and we can tell the same story, but we change the visual language around. So the visual language is the very fabric that grants meaning to interpreting scientific concepts, concepts and knowledge beyond our immediate experiences. How does the visual system work? Well, before you, you have a linguistic representation of elements of the Swedish royal family in four generations. And this representation is one-dimensional. It's sentential. To interpret it, you have to interpret it as a sequence. It's a one-dimensional representation of knowledge, and as you read it, slowly you build up a mental representation of what it might mean. We can take this information and turn it visually into a diagram, and all of a sudden, all the information is located in a plane, and we see immediately the relationships between the elements. Our visual processing system is of high bandwidth. It's very fast, and it also likes to chunk in information. We can take the same information and just arrange it very slightly. And here we have a hierarchical processing that's even quicker for your visual system. So it raises very interesting questions about how we can use visualization for harnessing new opportunities for learning and new opportunities for communication and being able to put visualization into spaces where learners and the public can be exposed to the power of visualization. Well, this visual language that I was speaking about, not so long ago, it was very static. But over the last decades, we have these emerging technologies where we are able to interact with the data. We can move it around. We can change it. It's no longer static. And we do that through various modes of different interaction, various emerging technologies where we manipulate this visualization in order to explore the data and then obtain communication of the intended messages. Whilst we do this, we also, in new emerging technologies, combine this with other senses. And that also adds to the process of being able to expose what remains invisible, what cannot be seen, and visualize it in new ways that can impact the way that we construct knowledge and the way that we learn new information and the way that we communicate. Some of our work before actually explored how students interpreted a visualization of a molecule that was 3D. And while they had a stereoscopic uh, interpretation of the molecule, at the same time, we added force feedback where they could actually feel the interactions between the molecules. While they performed the task, we also tracked 
what they were doing with the system. So while they held this haptic device and while they explored the molecule in a 3D stereoscopic sense, we also tracked what types of visual representations, what visual language were they using when they were doing different parts of the task. And what we found, the task is irrelevant, but what we found was that when you actually have the force feedback in combination, you learn better. And we also saw that when you receive the force feedback, you tend to do far less visual processing between these types of representation. So the haptic feedback in combination with the visualization almost lets you offload processing and free it up so that you can commit it to other learning resources. So this type of thinking really helped us think about the information visualization architecture that we use to process visual information during tasks. And what happens when you add other modalities? Well, what happens is you build referential connections and you are able to reduce the amount of processing required to solve the task. And you can free up this load and dedicate it to learning and also communication. So this helps us really understand the power of visual processing when we use it to explore visualization for learning and communication. However, the brain, while it is processing, we shouldn't also forget we need to take cognizance of the fact that when we are interacting with the visual information, when we are using these different types of interactive modes, we are also interacting in the environment. We're solving tasks that are often real time. We're also interacting with that information. It's a bi-directional type of information exchange. So the visualization, the interaction with the visualization is also part of the cognitive system and also the way that we use gestures and also interact is part of the system too. So what do you do if you want to visualize phenomena that are one million times smaller than you are tall, such as the nanoscale? Well, you can use the power of visualization to build virtual environments where the user can reach in, use gestural interaction, move objects around, and by doing that action, link those actions to the exploration and the explanation of nanophenomena that are very, very complex, and actually be able to create and construct concepts about very complex nanoconcepts and nanoprinciples. And what we found in working with the public was, although it's very, very tough and it's well known in the international literature, for us to visualize different orders of magnitude. What we found was when people were interacting with the system, they could get to grips with the nature of nanoconcepts and a lot of nano principles. What about the other way? What about visualizing issues that are very abstract and very challenging for learners? Like heat transfer. It's been known now for 50 or 60 years in the literature that these are really difficult concepts for kids to master. Well, if you augment thermal imagery directly onto a heat source like your body that you can move around, you can start to interrogate concepts such as heat transfer. Why are metals cold to the touch? They know they're not inherently cold. It's because of heat transfer, the heat differential, that now you can actually visualize it because before it remains invisible. And you can use these types of interactive visualizations and do experiments. You can do a whole suite of experiments in a visualization lab without any text and have a whole myriad of exposure to different types of conceptual understanding about thermal phenomena. So these are just three examples of data visualization that are real data. Real data is being visualized. And also, we have a situation where we're using different modes of interaction to interrogate and to also move and interact with that data. We do that to explore the data. This relationship is exploratory visualization. 
And we do that with an intended communication of a concept in mind like those that I showed you. And when we do that, it's explanatory visualization. And the moment that these two co-evolve, we have the sweet spot and the idea that I present tonight, exploration, first coined by Anders Inemann et al. And this is the situation, the confluence, the emergence of explanatory with exploratory visualization that brings a whole new paradigm of communication to the way that we think of the power of visualization for learning and also for communication. What if we could actually produce spaces that are designed around the exploration principle where you have opportunities to interact with data in this manner, to interact with data in this manner in order to explain very abstract and very complex scientific concepts. Well, we know, for example, that climate deniers, when you plot temperature changes over 150 years, they are very good at visually cherry-picking the data and saying, hold on, there are places where the temperature is decreasing. Climate change can't really be real. Well, if you actually are able to interact with real modeled scientific data visualization through exploration that allows for this confluence of interacting with the data and also receiving these messages simultaneously, you are able to put yourself in an experience of position where you can reason about the fact that all the scientific models taken together, there's actually more than a 98% correlation between these data, and therefore the truth must be that there are increases in temperature over time. And this brings us to the importance, the future importance of critical literacy amongst our citizenry. It is very, very important that we have the knowledge and that we have the skills to be able to perceive and negotiate the array of visual representations that we face on a daily basis. We're also very interested in how the public and learners approach these types of exhibits and how they interact with the data. So what we were doing, like in the first example, is we also track, we're interested in what they do. How do they interact? with this type of visualization. And we record these moment by moment events to find out what interactive patterns are associated with this type of exploration, but also how do features like guidance and pedagogical scaffolding help during this process? So these are aspects that we're also very, very interested in for the future as we delve further. We're also interested in thinking about examples where learners use visualizations and based on their interactions, for example, in building up systems thinking, the visualization adapts based on what they are doing and the information and what they are exploring in the visualization in terms of the content that they are searching. And what the application does is based on this interaction, then posts certain conceptual questions for the user based on their interactions. What if there was a place that could offer an opportunity to be able to engage an exploration for learning and for communication? Well, in Sweden, at the Visualization Center, there is exactly such a place where we are looking at the power of such types of environments, the multi-sensory opportunities that they offer in terms of different interactive modalities and how we can offer opportunities to link action to perception and conceptualization of very abstract knowledge to the public citizenry and also as a vehicle for learners and teachers to be able to be exposed to the future of visualization. 
Together with that, we also are chasing a new science of learning, a new science of learning that looks at the confluence of how we explore visualization and how we use visualization as explanative tools with the idea of exploration. With that, I would also like to acknowledge all the colleagues that have been part of this and are part of it right now as we pursue this vision of exploration. Thank you.